Welcome back to My Brain is a Wonderland, a podcast for neurodivergent women and the people who love them. You're here with your host, Emily, for the first episode of season two. It's been about seven months since our last episode, so I'm so happy to be back with all of you. I feel like a whole new woman with a bunch of other issues and delights and things to discuss with you. Today, we're going to be talking about food, my relationship with food, my hyperfixations, binging, patterns, and maybe some things that I can share with you that have helped me, and just my experience in the whole arena of eating. The first thing I want to talk about is hyperfixation meals. If you are out there and you have ADHD, you probably know what I'm talking about. It is this thing where you find a meal, and it can be any meal at all. I have done this with tuna pasta salad. I've done this with Caesar salad. I don't know why there's a salad theme here. Um, uh, Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Oh my god, that was a big one for a while. And what happens is you eat it one day, and you may have had this meal many times before, and you eat it one day, and it just becomes everything. Absolutely everything. You think about it, or at least I do, I think about it multiple times throughout the day. Oftentimes I'll eat breakfast or lunch and then think about the next time I'm going to be able to eat this meal. And I'll usually make a whole bunch of it, especially if it's something like a tuna pasta salad, or if it's PB&J, I'll make sure I have a bunch of peanut butter and bread and jelly in the house. And I'll eat it every day, which could be for weeks. It could be every day for two weeks, could be every day for four weeks. I'll even eat it in addition to meals because I just have to have it and nothing else is satiating me. Eventually, what will happen is one day you'll go to eat this meal that you've been thinking about obsessively for weeks and it'll taste like nothing. And what I mean by that is not that it doesn't taste like anything in your mouth, but in your brain, in your experience, it just is like you're eating the most bland thing. Like a lot of people who you might know who aren't neurodivergent, how they might think of a salad, right? If they have to go on a diet and you say, okay, now you're eating plain salad, rice crackers, and that feeling of just eating to eat, and it's so boring and bland, that is what eventually happens with these hyperfixation meals, is you just kind of are over it one day. And I'm having that right now, actually. I My latest hyperfixation meal, like I mentioned before, was chicken Caesar salad, and it's been a fixation meal in the past for me. There's something about the refreshing crunch. I often fixate on, um, not often, but sometimes there'll be a crunchy aspect to that, and I'm wondering if that's a sensory feeding thing, that I like crunchy texture, like cucumbers, lettuce, things like that. But I'll basically cook up a bunch of chicken breast, so it's cold and in the fridge and ready to go. I have six right now ears, no, hearts of lettuce in the fridge, which is a lot of lettuce. I live with one other person and I have six of those and I have cucumbers. I don't usually put anything else in there, maybe tomato. I don't eat pepper because it's bad for my stomach or raw onion, but I'll basically do cold chicken, lettuce, cucumber, and throw a bunch of Caesar salad dressing on that and call it a day. And I will eat that. I said I would eat it like once a day. I could eat that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for weeks if it's my hyperfixation meal. But what has happened recently is that has fallen off. My hyperfixation meal of Caesar salad probably fell off three or four days ago. And so I have all of this chicken, all of this lettuce, And now I know I have to eat it, so I'm probably going to make chicken Caesar salad tonight, but my body is literally saying, throw it away. Just don't eat it. Eat something else. Order a pizza. You don't want this. And the thing is, the thing is what's really frustrating is why does that happen? Why is it 
you get this hyperfixation, which I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about dopamine and how that feeds into eating and that kind of thing. But why does it all of a sudden drop off? Why is this thing that you're obsessed with just all of a sudden blah? It feels like nothing. And I think with people with ADHD, this happens with hobbies too, right? You get fixated on, I'm knitting now, I'll buy all the knittings, all the needles, all the things, all the patterns. You know, four weeks later, I'm over it, it sits in the closet. You know, now I'm into growing my own herbs. I buy all the herbs, all the pots, and now there's dead herbs in pots six weeks later in your yard. I want to get a little bit into where this actually comes from. I don't want this to be a science-focused or research-focused podcast. I really want this to be about my experience. Um, But I do want to talk about where I know from my own research where this comes from. And what happens is that with people who have ADHD, they're generally lacking a particular gene. And I'm not sure what the gene is. I don't care. Like I said, this isn't trying to be a science podcast. But that gene, or lacking that gene, or having a mutation of that gene, makes it difficult for your neurons in your brain to respond to dopamine. So what dopamine is, is it's something that's released in your body, again, not a science podcast, and it gives you feelings of pleasure, and it helps regulate attention. Ding, ding, ding. Sound familiar? So a lot of people with ADHD will suffer from depression, because they simply don't have For many reasons, obviously, we're going through a lot, but oftentimes because they're lacking in dopamine, that feeling of pleasure is not there, and you have to seek it out with certain things, like um, hobbies, food, doing crazy things sometimes, impulse control uh, issues where you're like, I'm seeking out this thing that seems a little strange or a little bit out there, because you're lacking in dopamine, and those things give you dopamine. When you eat, it generally releases dopamine, but there are certain foods that give you more of a kick of dopamine or give you more of that rush of dopamine that feels so ever-present when you eat. And a couple of those things are carbohydrates and sugars. So if you, I love to eat pasta, okay? I could eat plates of pasta till the day is done. That is just kind of a lifelong hyperfixation for me. It will drop off, like I said, tuna pasta salad is one of those things I love. But if you ever put a plate of pasta in me, that's being put away right away. Sugar, not so much. Not to say I haven't been obsessed with sugar. We have an amazing donut place close by that I have been obsessed with and gotten a little bit bigger because of that in my weight, because I was just eating so many donuts. Crumble cookie is another one. I mean, it's just that feeling of satiation from eating things that are sugary and carbohydrate And what will happen is it'll give you that rush of dopamine, and then you become fixated on that, or you'll start to binge eat. That's a really common issue I've had in the past, that I have been a big binge eater. So I could go all day forgetting to eat, or I could have eaten all day, and then I could still be eating. And people have commented on that in the past when I was living in a shared house in college. I remember I was eating a lot. And I think because my freshman year of college was very stressful and a new experience for me, so I focused on that dopamine hit of binge eating. And I was eating big breakfasts, then I would have a bunch of pasta for lunch, and then an hour later I would eat more. And I remember one of my housemates commenting on that, saying, you know, you already ate like an hour ago. Why are you eating another plate of like a full dinner, you know? And so that's where a lot of that binging and hyperfixation comes from, is that dopamine hit that you get. So that's why I'm wondering, why does that wear off? Where does that kind of uh, feeling go away. Because sometimes I'll also get hyperfixated, let's on, let's say, not eating a lot, eating healthily, and working out. And I've been so hyperfixated on working out in the past that it's been unhealthy for me, that I've gotten so skinny, quite athletic, but I'm just not eating enough, I'm tired all the time, anxious, cranky, 
So I just wonder if anyone knows or if anyone has any theory about that, feel free to contact me. I'm really interested into why the hyperfixation just disappears all of a sudden. And the problem I'm having now is you would think it maybe gets replaced with something else. And the thing is, it doesn't. It takes another couple of weeks or so, maybe less, maybe more, to find that other hyperfixation. So I'm in that horrible space right now where I don't want my chicken Caesar salad that's sitting in the fridge. I have like eight chicken breasts cut up in there that I cooked. Um, my six hearts of um, lettuce, two cucumbers, you know, all three bottles of Caesar salad in the, cl- in the cupboard because I wanted to make sure I had enough. And I'm over it, but there's nothing to replace it. If my husband said to me, okay, what do you want for dinner? You know, actually, when I said that in my brain, my brain said pizza. That, I don't know if that's a hyper hyperfixation thing. I'm not thinking, oh, I could eat that and eat that forever. But I am thinking that that would satiate me. That kind of salty carb thing that I was talking about, which is so common in binge eating, carbs, salty, or sugar with people with ADHD. But it's just, I'm in this just really terrible place where nothing seems satisfying. No food seems like it could really satiate me. I think if I ate a pizza, I'd enjoy it right then. But would I hyperfixate on it? I don't know. Do I want to hyperfixate on anything? I'm not sure. It's something to look forward to, I guess. But it definitely fills up my day with those thoughts. And um, I don't always think that's productive, Uh, or not productive, but healthy for my mental space, because I'm constantly waiting for the next meal to eat this meal. And uh, I don't know if that's a good thing. Another thing I wanted to talk about, in addition to the binging, is, I guess binging is the same, similar kind of thing, but talk about this kind of overeating to fullness. I really had to learn, once I was an adult in my 30s, really, because in my 20s I didn't think about it at all, and especially when I was a kid, I was always told I had to finish my plate. Always told I had to finish my plate. And I did grow up with people, I think my mom has ADHD, my grandmother might, so I did grow up around other neurodivergent people who were raising me, but I was always taught you had to finish your plate. However, I'm not even sure if that was really where this came from, where this feeling of fullness is just so satisfying. So you know, or maybe you don't know, but when you look into, you know, diets in the 90s and these horrible dieting cultures, they often tell you, eat until Like, don't eat as much. Once you're not hungry anymore, stop eating. They don't say to really eat until you're full. They say, wait until you're hungry. Then when you are eating, stop eating once you're not hungry anymore, because that means you are actually full. And I'm not saying that in particular is a bad thing, but you see it a lot in these diet culture procedures, you know, that that is one of the things you don't ever eat until you're full. And I have always gotten so much pleasure. I don't know if this is a sensory thing or I just got used to it from binging, but I've gotten so much pleasure from eating until I'm so full. And that can range from being full that I can't eat anymore to having like the biggest food baby and that I couldn't breathe. I mean, I've been in situations where I've eaten so much food that I have to shallow breathe because I cannot fill my lungs. That's not good. You know, I'm talking about diet culture is not good. That's not good either. You know, not being able to inflate your lungs fully because you've eaten so much food. And I'm not talking about doing this every once in a while because that's fine. If you, you know, have fun, go to the buffet. I love a good Indian buffet and will eat until I can't eat anymore. But this is something that I used to do daily at every meal that, you know, my meal, my breakfast had to be 
filling. My lunch had to be filling. And my dinner before I went to bed had to be super filling. And it didn't really leave space for anything else. It was always about the food and filling up. And that makes me physically very uncomfortable. I have irritable bowel syndrome as well, which is often um, diagnosed with neurodivergency. The gut is supposed to be the second brain, another science term for you there. I don't know if that's a science term, but it's a bit sciencey. And uh, doctors are now thinking that the gut plays a much bigger role in our emotions, our brain, our behavior than they ever thought before. And so that's always been an issue for me. Filling up, binging till I'm full, and this hyperfixation thing. And I mean, I remember I'm having a flash now from when I was in high school. And I, this is one of the times for a year or so, I was vegetarian for a year and I was obsessed with working out. I mean, obsessed to the point that it was unhealthy. My breasts got really tiny. My period stopped. Like I lost so much weight and wasn't eating at all. But there would be nights where I would go into the kitchen and we had a stand-up freezer in the kitchen and I can even think of it now. I can taste it in my mouth. I can picture it happening. My mom used to get this, I mean, looking back, it must have been a liter of ice cream. You know, it wasn't a Ben and Jerry's pint, let me tell you. There was probably like six of those in there and it was organic chocolate ice cream. And I used to go to town on that thing. And by go to town, I mean eat the entire thing. And it was frantic. My husband comments on it now. I don't taste my food. You know, I'm not a chewer. I inhale my food. It's just this kind of frantic need to eat, to be stimulated by that food. And another thing I used to do now, I'm having all these flashes. When I was a kid, Does anyone remember or know of, I don't know if they're still around because I just avoid it because I know what will happen, Sara Lee, the brand Chocolate Gatto, it was a frozen chocolate like mousse cake, layered mousse cake. When I was a kid, literally a 8, 9, 10, 11 year old child, I would be given one of those cakes out of the freezer and you're supposed to let it defrost. I often wouldn't let it defrost and I would just eat the entire thing and I would inhale my food. It would be gone in not much time. I mean, I've inhaled plates of pasta in one minute, you know? I mean, it's it's this kind of frantic focus on the stimulation that's provided by eating and it's not even the taste a lot of the time. It is, I talked about earlier, that I often like crunchy things. It's often this just kind of sensory feeling of eating and moving your mouth and then becoming full, uh, with this underlying sense of the satiation from the salt and the sugar. Another thing, saying salt and sugar, that I've done often in the past is alternate the salt and sugar eating. So man, you can catch me with a block of cheese and a chocolate bar, and I'll take a bite of the cheese, satiated by salt. Then I'll take a cube of the chocolate, satiated by sugar. And I could rotate like that until the end of time, to be honest. It's this, like I said, frantic satiation with kind of feeding this sensory need and maybe dopamine hit that I'm feeling. Maybe I'm feeling satisfied by it. And that's, it also makes me sad because reading up about this, what it's telling me, what I'm deducing from this then, is that I am so low on dopamine in general, I'm not happy. I'm not, maybe not that I'm not happy, but I'm not feeling pleasure very often, right? Dopamine is supposed to give you pleasure and regulate your attention. 
well, yeah, I have issues with attention. That I can deal with. That's not sad. That's just what it is. But not feeling pleasure? That's one of the greatest joys of being a human. You know, we are flesh and bone and body, and I want to feel pleasure in my experiences, in my physical body, in my emotional, mental body. I want to do things that bring me joy, that excite me. And I wonder if the hyperfixations, the binging, the needing to be feeling full comes around more when I'm not feeding dopamine in other areas. And this is just coming to me now. Maybe it's that I'm not seeking out the things, the other things I enjoy in life. Art museums, that's one of my greatest joys. Going shopping, That's another impulse control thing. But I tell you, even just window shopping, I could do that for days. Yeah, maybe that's one of the things I need to look at when I notice that I'm focusing on food. Is am I getting pleasure from other areas in my life? I want you to think about that too, now that I've thought about that. And let me know if you think that might be correlated. I'd love to hear from you. Because I'm thinking probably masquerades a little bit as depression. Because, you know, depression can be not feeling pleasure, not feeling anything. And it's not necessarily that I'm depressed, I'm just not feeling dopamine. And then I'm seeking, or maybe not seeking out food, I just eat food and then get pleasure and dopamine from it and then fixate on that instead of trying to turn my head to something else. So let me know if you relate to that. If that's resonating with you, feel free to reach out to me. I would love to hear from you. You can reach me at my brain is a wonderland pod on Gmail, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. And if you are enjoying what you're hearing, I would love for you to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It helps me get this content out there to more people who really need to hear it. So I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you again on My Brain is a Wonderland, Season 2.